and welcome everybody it's the live stream wow i can't believe i say this every time i can't believe another month has passed i don't know if it's because i'm getting older and time goes faster or if these just coming around more frequently but we're here again and still no thunderbirds i'm sorry i i will get on and do the thunderbirds soon but in the meanwhile i did some work on some like an ebook for starting cinema, which I never did when I realised I didn't actually enjoy writing books or ebooks. Um, so I've been using that material this evening, so it hasn't gone to waste, which is a relief, at least. You'll get to see that video. It's about an hour long, and I'm obviously going to talk through it. It's um, all about tools and materials, and I'd got around to writing the tools and materials bits of most of the chapters, and that was it. So the glue stuff came from it last time, and this is the full thing, mine's the glues, because we've obviously used those already. But welcome to everybody that's here. I've got quite a few people in chat. Um, what have we got here? We've got some good questions. So welcome to everybody I've already said um, hello to in chat. Um, everybody else entering now. Andy T says, I'll have to go by nine, but we'll enjoy until then. Well, enjoy the beer, enjoy the, the live stream, Andy. Um, polite, will there be a part in the stream for tools to separate your fingers after using super glue? Hmm, I find water and careful manipulation just pull, you just pull a layer of skin off basically. You can actually get super glue remover and I've used it on hard surfaces, never tried it on me. Welcome Jaw 21 from a rainy campsite in Cornwall. Is there any other type of campsite but rainy? Uh, it seems to rain solidly. As an aside, I went to visit my dad for a week last week and he lives by the seaside in Mersey Island. It's um, south of Colchester, it's on a causeway, so it's actually an island at high tide. And it sounds very exciting. <laughs> it rained every day. Last year was beautiful hot weather, you know, there's beaches there and stuff. Not that I go sit on a beach. This year it was just like, it's rained. It's still raining. And one day we were supposed to go and watch the Cobmarsh races, they, they go around the island or out around to the Cobmarsh Island. And it was just, it poured with rain. So we just sat inside. I finished reading the Heir to the Empire trilogy, which is about Thrawn, ready for Ahsoka at the end of the month. Very stoked for Ahsoka. She is probably my favorite tied with Captain Rex, Star Wars character. If you're not into it, don't worry. But yeah, um, it was a nice week, but, and I got quite a lot of modeling done, but no test printing for work, but I, I didn't sadly get much sun. So that's the UK summer. Everywhere else, baking, wildflower, fires, you know, all that sort of stuff. Us, torrential rain. We just have to be different. Um, hi, Tamsin again. Tamsin's one of my print testers. And oh, I forgot to copy across the NetFab files. And she does a lot of work for me on my uh, Kickstarter for, for free. Thank you, Tamsin. I do really, really appreciate everything you do. Um, Timber says, nice intro. Thanks, Timber. Um, because I'm getting old, I can't even remember what I said five minutes ago. Um, and then, hi, I need at this point to thank my moderators, Digger, Timber and Norm. They do a great job keeping you guys in order and keeping those adult chatbots away. So um, thanks to those three. I really do appreciate it. And then, hi to Anthony Borden from Princetown, New Jersey. Very nice. And... Um, well, yeah, I think that's everybody. I've already said hello to a few people in chat, so there we go. So, quick update on life generally, as this is a live stream, and I presume you've, um, as you tuned in to listen to it, you've got a passing interest in me at some point and what I'm doing. Um, so, I've been working on my Lava Kickstream, uh, Kickstarter. It's, um, it's going well. I wanted to be maybe a few days ahead of where I am on the printing because... Printing takes a long time, especially if you're doing FDM large pieces. And what I'm printing at the moment as sort of foot high boards for the edge, which are just a little whimsy. It's the diorama person in me going, actually, I still want to have something that looks cool as well as just terrain. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been doing that, but I have to say, I'm just writing a, um, a sort of email. I, do, I have an email list on MailChimp from my website. And it's kind of hidden a bit now because I took the blog off because it was getting unwieldy and I needed to sort it and update it. And then I just haven't. And I streamlined it down and put a portfolio on and a few other things and haven't updated that either. 
But I, I went on to put on my next Kickstarter on the front page, the home page of the website, and I thought, well, there's nowhere to sign up for the email on the front page even. Um, so I've put it in the footer at the bottom of every page now, I think. I hope that footer's on the bottom of every page. I think it is. And basically um, updated some of the links and did a few things like that. But I am going to try and get on with doing that email list more often. At the moment, it's months between it because it was a lot of my early stuff was railway. And I guess a lot of these people on it are railway people. And what I'm writing about is generally more terrain, 3D print scenery. And you can still use it for dioramas, but it's a different style. So I haven't kept it as updated, but I'm going to start plugging it on the um, Kickstarters and things like that and getting people to sign up for it. So you'll see a lot more content going through. And I have a sort of, um, I must do better on doing my social media because I'm not a fan really of doing social media that much. So I need to get on with that. So anyway, that's a long way of saying, if you want to sign up for my email um, list and you know you want to sort of, I won't say weekly because I'm that bad, but you know, if you want a regular update on how I'm doing, then you know it's on the front page now, right at the bottom of my website and at the bottom of any page of my website if you want to go across. So there we are. That's what I've been doing. I've also been a bit demoralised about tidying my house. I have, and it's the next live stream, which is why there's no Thunderbirds again. Um, I have a brand new studio upstairs. It's beautiful. I want to show it off. It is a tip though, because I brought loads of stuff up, put it away. I filled, I mean, I've got about, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I've got about 12 plus an island with an extract fan in it, plus like, I don't know, seven or eight wall cabinets, loads of cabinets, a bookcase for work in progress models, and I have so much stuff. I haven't got enough room in it. I have run out of room already in it. And I've still got about eight or 10 of the fold fat crates, like these ones over here. Yeah, let's just do that. Over here, I can never point that way. Um, I was trying it earlier and I was getting the mirror looking at it this way. I should just remember that it's over my shoulder. Um, yeah, I, I've got like eight or 10 of those with no home. I've got stuff that's too big to go in kitchen cabinets, really. And I've got, like, you know, I've got my new lava board I've just done, and it's nowhere for it to live because the previous Kickstarter is still there and there's nowhere for that to go. So I'm just really, yeah. I mean, the Millennium Falcon alights in the middle of the rug on the floor, which is ironically the Millennium Falcon. So all in all, I was supposed to be tidying that today and I went and played on the website because it was easier than tidying it. I just don't know where to put everything anymore. I've run out of space. And it, I need an extension, but I've literally just had one. So yeah, but that'll be in a month's time. So I have a deadline for tidying it. And it's actually the middle of my house now, the middle floor, which is my bedrooms, so that's the worst, because I've got a whole room still with all the boxes in. But I just trip over everything upstairs. Everything takes a lot of space. 3D prints, I test print everything. So I threw out two crates of just test prints from the last Kickstarter. But I've still got a couple of crates of test prints that I might use if I do a future desert one or sci-fi one or spaceport one or something so <sighs> so there we go um here we go Lee Lavery I think I'm going to stick oh good pun with this live stream the last one was on glue um and then who else I didn't miss anyone there did I no and then Andy says I used to live in Malden in Essex no in Somerset. Okay. Well, you're now in Somerset. I get it. It's missing a W. Yeah. Um, so we went to Brightlingsea and we went around there, but we, we went to Malden once or twice, but we didn't go this time. We go up to Harwich every time and go and look at Felixstowe. And a couple of years ago, was it last year? Yeah, before. We saw the ship, the Ever Given, that blocked the Suez Canal and Boaty McBoatface, otherwise known as the David Attenborough. So David Attenborough in and out that day and it was rammed this time it was all raining and there was like no one there it was really cold so we kind of went to the cafe and watched the boats for a bit um so yeah but it's fun so guilty me i've got new glasses if you're wondering why i keep doing this and i can't get the middle ground in focus anymore and it's all right when i sit here and work because it's um 
it's in the right focus plane. But sitting back here, I'm, I'm like, that's in focus, that's not. So I'm like doing this all the time, trying to get oh, glasses, hey. Um, so Guilty, Guilty Me says, thanks for all your amazing videos. I'm new in diorama making, you a huge inspiration. Thanks from Norway. Thank you so much. And I will still be doing dioramas. I might have gone into doing 3D print um, sort of Kickstarters. But if I look at the one I'm doing at the moment, it's lava. And I've got two, di three dioramas actually planned from it. One of which is just a lava end board, really, with, um, I don't know, just some scenery. It's just lava, basically, not that exciting. I've got Vader's Castle, which has got a channel of lava down the front. And um, I'm doing a Guardian Jedi from Dark Fire Designs, which is holding rocks on a lava base. And then on the other side, I'm going to do the duel from Annie and Obi. So it's all very Star Wars, but it is lava um, that time. So there we go. That's that one. But I'm hoping that I can do a few more with mud and grass in between. And especially when I get back to the Thunderbirds, because that'll be proper like scenic modelling. Um, Norm says, cleaning and tidying give me a headache. <sighs> Tell me about it. There are just so many better things to do than clean or tidy, in my view. Um, <laughs> stating the obvious, lack of space, the final frontier. <laughs> hey, that is very true. Um, and then Timbersurf says, bad tools, lol. I, I just, I, you know, you, you end up with a lot of tools. You end up with a lot of supplies. You might buy one thing. And I often do this. I buy a lot of stuff for a project I don't then use because I change what I'm going to do or it doesn't work. So I might have bought 20 of something thinking I'll do 20 of these and then it doesn't work. So I end up with a lot of materials, which just isn't great. Um, I don't know. I need to throw some more stuff out. And don't get me wrong, I have already got rid of 60 or 70 crates worth of stuff. So, yeah. And Andy knows about the glasses, that one. So what I am doing is getting rid of a couple. I should probably put myself on the side. Oops. Put that on the side that is not got me in the middle of it. There we go. Um, I've got three dioramas that are going to cycle now. And I'm going to get rid of them for space reasons. I don't think they're... I turn that one around. Why are you still upside down? I'm looking at it from above because of where it's wedged in the room. I'm like, I turned you. It looks like that, but the other way up. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of them. And if anybody wants them, it'll be a come and pick them up sort of jobby. Those two have fallen off. But if anybody wants them, I just want to get rid of them, really. They're not wired or anything. They're just literally display dioramas to put trains on. But if you do, drop me a note, um, my email, or um, through Instagram, or don't do personal Facebook, because I never answer that. My page, Facebook, or whatever. I don't really do Facebook either. I do any threads. It's like, okay, I never did Twitter, so what am I supposed to do with threads? I just post everything else, the same as I've already posted on Instagram. I'm really confused by that. Anyway, still there. Don't do much with it. So these are the three. The two of them are MRVP ones, and I always hated them. They didn't really work. Um, so I just was never that happy with them. But, you know, they're there. They're, some of the bits are good. I mean, the rock works fine. I just didn't nail the colours on this. I think they could do with a bit more colour. This one's fine. It's just got battered in the um, building works, the plastic sheet over it, not those two guys off. So I'll glue them on. Um, before they go and then this one is spring and it's wire trees with rubber and and it, it's not as bad as the autumn one but um it's still not my favorite of my dioramas but they're very big is the reason they're going they don't fit anywhere in my new house they fitted on top of some old work um sort of units that I've got rid of so I just and that one's very wide so they're just too wide for me that's why they're going um I've still got some that are too wide um but they're staying so anyway if you do want them um you know let me know so there we go little plug done um so norm says just buy a used caravan and park it in your driveway and fill it up with your stuff no someone said to me i should get a storage unit uh, tamsin actually i think it was didn't you uh, i don't know if you're suggesting i should get a storage unit if you felt you should get one but um we <sighs> i may as well put it in the bin i'll never find it i i open up stuff now and i go oh <gasps> God, I bought this. And I've got some really big sci-fi kits that I want to do. Um, like I've got a massive Optimus Prime and I've got two Optimus Primes I built already. I love Optimus Prime. 
It's quite a boxy one. It's off the new Bumblebee release. So it's gone back to a boxier shape. I thought it was um, last night and some of the more recent ones before Rise of the Beast. It was a bit girly. It was getting a bit curvy. It should be a bit more boxy. But anyway, um, I did enjoy Rise of the Beast in a funny way. So I do love um, those. I want to do that. I've got a massive set of boxes. I mean, some of the boxes I've got, like I've got a box this big for a Gundam. It's too big to fit on the screen. And it builds into something about this size. You're like, the box is this big. Um, I need to go on and build them. But as always, it's time. So what I did get this weekend, and totally forgot to put the videos up for, uh, is, um, and I teased it, you might have seen the feet and the head on one of my Instagram posts. And basically, I bought two mannequins, one for my Emperor Giorgio um, cosplay that's in the hallway, which does freak people out if they don't expecting a big standing figure in my hallway. And she's a little taller than me, so I have to say the skin tight leggings look really good on her. But getting them on was tough. You know, I finally worked out how to move the legs slightly. Um, and so I put her on with Empress Georgia, and she's got like the full wig and everything. I wore it once to Destination Star Trek. And I started a Titanfall cosplay, which is my favourite game, Titanfall 2. And it's an assassin, and she basically wears like military stuff, but it's quite skin tight. And um, I'm going to put the standard Titanfall helmet on, which I would like to get on with at some point soon. And I put that on a mannequin and it's in the middle of the upstairs landing. And every time I walk upstairs, I'm like, oh, person, I'll get used to it soon. It's going to move, but I can't get it into the room yet that I want to move it to because it's not tidy enough. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that seeing it out regularly will remind me to finish it. But it was quite weird carrying two mannequins. And my mum, I've got a little picture of my mum and the mannequins. I really should have found that and did it um, for you guys. But um, that's quite fun. It will go on the next one instead because it will be part of the studio tour. That's what we call a tease, like a month and a half out. Um, but those are, uh, so the big um, house of Fraser in our area, which was BT's, is shutting down. And I walked through and saw loads of the storage units with mum. And I went, oh, I wonder if they've got mannequins. We went around the corner and there were the mannequins. And there were only two complete female ones on a stand left and with hands and everything. Because most of them have lost a hand or lost a foot or something. So I got them and they're like 20 quid each and they're on a glass plate and they stand up. And it was just like, yeah, okay. So now I've got two blooming mannequins in my house as well. I had a Taylor's dummy before. Anyway, enough blabbing on about my, you know. I mean, I look at them and I realize I am tall and thin and I am fat and short compared to these things. And my mum is about half their height. And you think, no wonder people worry about body image when that's what they're putting the clothes on. Look at it, there's nothing to them. I can get their whole bum in one hand practically. You know, so anyway, let's not get on to that. Let's get back to modelling. Um, so Timber says, I am a tool god Ooh, with a capital G. I have them all, rooms full and not tidy, so can't find them. I had two tripling for couplers, pliers, because I lost one, bought one. Got a lot of that. Um, Timber does say a storage unit is just a money pit. That's what I thought, um, because I may as well throw it in the bin and save my money. Because if I, it's a storage unit, I'll never get it out again. I just won't remember I've got it. Andy T, I wanted to do a diorama of the Bristol Clifton Rocks Railway. That would be fun. But being underground, I really can't visualise how to do it. You do a cutaway, I guess. Um, maybe a sort of a run. I've seen people do the underground on the front of other railways quite often. And it's just literally a drain pipe size. I was thinking of doing a subway diorama that was a big column, a New York one, um, up and probably 14th and 8th and or 8th and 14th, whichever around it goes. And there'll be one going this way, one going that way. I think there's a mezzanine level going that way. And then there's the entrance out and the shops and the buildings on top. And I thought it'd be really cool. You know, I looked at somewhere like Baker Street would be good for it in the UK because it's got some really old and some really newer ones and some interesting buildings. So, you know, something like that would also be interesting. Um, Digger, yeah, he saw those two, yeah. <laughs> we'll put it, I haven't done the studio video yet. Um, oh, Andy, uh, Timber thinks a three quarter cutaway, well, I was thinking more half, but yeah, that's cool. It's actually the problem I've got with the hangers for the Thunderbirds, and I don't quite know how to deal with those, because what I was thinking of doing was a big island. It is going to be big if I do. Another thing I won't have space for, so those probably will have to get sold. And if I take the front to come off, then you can look into the hanger and when you put it on, you make an island. So there's always a thought to make a removable front. Bit of work though. Lee says, I've got a model of a Roman galleon that's been sat on the shelf for three years. 
terrible is. Um, so you've got a model of a Roman galleon that's been sat on a shelf for three years. Um, I'm like, I've got stuff that's 20 years old sat in boxes still. Okay, three years is um, really quite short. Don't worry, Lee. You have not reached the depths yet of hoarding. It's when you're back, I filled my understairs cupboard and then realized I couldn't get the hoover in it. So I had to take five crates out. So, um, and that's mostly big sci-fi kits in the understairs cupboard, plus all the Thunderbirds ones I've got. I'll get this um, for doing that. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it, but I do have a tip because you said trouble is the instructions are in Japanese. If you get your phone and get Google Translate and put it into photo mode, when you hold your phone, you can do it on the app, you might be able to do it on the web. When you hold your phone over it, it will auto translate the instructions from Japanese into English. It's a brilliant tool, which I use occasionally when doing Gundam kits, because most Gundam kits, you can just follow the instructions. But every now and then I just wonder what they're saying. And um, I do that, it's wonderful. You should, should try that tick. It's really good. Um, yeah. So, scale model craft. I'd love to have a mannequin with a full rocketeer suit. If I were, or yeah, Indiana Jones. Yeah, they would be good. I, I under nod, if I could have found a third, I probably would have got a third, but A, I couldn't fit it in the house and B, I couldn't find a full complete one. And I actually have a tailor's dummy that Emperor Giorgio was on before, but the, um, the trousers had to be pinned around the front because it has one pole up the middle, which is hard to get trousers onto. Um, but yeah, yeah. So, Timber says learn Japanese or get the app, the Google app with or Google Translate app, just easier. And um, <laughs> scale model craft, I love doing underground building. You mean you just do the bit of earth? <laughs> Jaw 21, would you say name brand tools are always best? I bought some sprue cutters from Timu and can't tell the difference between them and the name brand. So I have some Despy um, side nippers and I do think they're really good but I don't have an unnamed brand to try them against and what I haven't tried is God Hand which are supposed to be the best side nippers. So I would look at them and go it's very hard to tell unless you have both sets. Where I've I've generally not got the name but I've got a Dremel rather than Dremel alike I might have I don't know I would say for most things you can probably get away with the knockoff but every now and then it does make a difference but the trick is just googling to see there are people who've invested a lot of money so they'll always big them up um so yeah oh and Tim says see Luke Towen's underground diorama that was a really cool diorama I don't I didn't see I haven't actually seen his latest one I must go and look at that on YouTube I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube at the moment because I'm reading some books and um, it, it all goes in the same time space, so I do one or the other. Jeffrey, rather than throwing stuff away, you could make up some mystery boxes and sell them on your website filled with bits and surplus supplies that you know you'll never use. See, I don't want to sell physical stuff because then I have to mail it, and that's me being a little bit lazy. But most of the, um, like all my railway stuff that I was getting rid of went to, um, and that was like all of it practically. I'm not kidding anyone. Most of my railway stuff went because I just don't have enough space. Um, so what's left is scenery supplies, absolute oodles of scenery supplies and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But most they all went to anoraks. Um, so if you want any of the stuff there, a thousand detail parts for HO scale stuff and loads of projects that I had planned to do. And I look at them now and I just go, I just know I don't have time for them and I don't have space for them. I need to let some of it go. So on my project planner for my like YouTube channel, I had do this, do that, do the other. I'm not going to tell you because you're going to say they're amazing and I've got rid of the stuff now. And A, each of them takes longer than I really have time for right now because I've half my modelling time because I'm designing for the Kickstarter in the morning and the other, and in the evening I work on Kickstarter stuff as well. And, and then that half has to do things that paint up the models that I'm doing for the Kickstarter. And everything I have is in the wrong scale for that. So it's just a matter of space, really. You know, I can always, I can, I have scenery stuff to do any scale, but I've done a lot more sci-fi recently in recent years and I really enjoy not having to get stuff running. Sounds bad, but you know, yeah. But I have too many dioramas. Um, 
Link, please. Timber, link. Um, yeah, I'll let him do. Stating the obvious, not bragging, but I have kits from the 1980s. Where does the time go? I don't have any back that far. I think I, I got out of it and then got back into it. But I've been in back in this hobby for 25 years, so maybe 23 years. So I had stuff right back from the beginning when I first started. Luke Subway, he's put the list up. Oh, um, Digger, could you put a link to my Discord? I do post regularly what I'm up to on my Discord and stuff like that. So Andy T says, just sold my one sixth scale Rocketeer vinyl. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I, I want to do more six scale. I love Dormal Snows. I own four of his figures. I wish I could afford more. Sadly, I'm now a penniless creator. Um, but yeah, he does beautiful stuff. So scale model craft. All my dioramas include underground rooms and passages, but I've not done a railroad yet. That's fun. That's really fun. Sable. So timber has sable stash acquired beyond life expectancy. That's actually what I've just done. I've just um, got rid of a whole load of stuff that I know I was never going to do. It is just, um, yeah. You just buy, I, I buy too much stuff. Now I'm buying SDLs, which at least don't take any physical space. Um, so Digger says, there's, so there's a lot of scenery products left over. I've kept all my scenery stuff, like nothing scenery. What I've got rid of are kits and um, rolling stock, you know, and t track laying stuff, really. So there's just all of that stuff still kept because I still use scenery all the time. Um, it's what I do, it's my first love. So, all right, so we've got loads of, I don't even get some of these. Um, stating the obvious to timber surf. Too true, the ABC ratio is very high. We'll get there. So in a minute, I'll put the video on, but let me just check this last one from Norm. Someone should open up a diorama gallery, bricks and mortar store, shop, and all the modelers can sell the dioramas they've no more room for. I think it's called an art gallery. Oh, and thanks for doing the Discord digger. Thank you very much. So I'm going to shove the movie on in the background so we can talk tools and materials. Now it starts and the glues are at the front of it. So um, I probably should actually just start that again and go back to pause. And so uh, because there were like all the glues, some of these don't quite follow on because I've obviously removed the glues from last time. So um, yeah. Ah, so um, stating the obvious acquired building completed for ABC and scale model craft. I did the math. They must be American because if they were British, they'd have maths is a common term in our club where you realize you can't find the stash and it's a Z. So definitely American. Um, you can't finish the stash. Yeah, I had more kits than I would ever have will to build. So anyway, tools, let's get on. And sorry if that clap was a bit loud. Um, so first thing up. Last time, you can watch it if you haven't, we did glues. So this time we're doing all the stuff that's not gluing, basically. And one of the first things that I would have put up was tweezers, but apparently I don't have these on here yet. So hopefully they'll appear in a minute or I just missed them off. But my number one tool, I don't remember putting them on here. My number one tools are tweezers, knives and cutting mat. So those are my top three tools. And if they come up in a sec, we'll talk about them then. If not, you know, well, we'll talk about them anyway. But number tool number four, which is the start of the video, are sanding equipment. And um, this is because whenever you glue something, you might get a bit of overgluage. Whenever you want to neaten up a seam line from a plastic kit, whatever it is you want to do, woodwork, scenery, whatever it is, foam work, you'll probably end up using sanding of some sort. And I have a mix of small metal files, small and sort of medium size, emery boards, which are very cheap to buy bulk, and sanding sponges. I also have some really fancy, small, thin, small sanding sponges in various, very minute through to, like this one may as well do nothing, it's so fine, type of sponges for doing plastic model kits. So um, there we go. I just saw Timber's joke. We'll come to that in a minute. So I I do recommend just getting some memory boards, but they're a bit coarse. You do need something finer as well. I think disposable cups was on the glue section. And one of the reasons that I, um, I include them, and they're so hard to photo clear stuff, can I say, on a white background, just to get that out there. 
Um, because I use them for mixing things. You can use any cheap plastic containers that you've picked up, yogurt pots, ice cream tubs are really good because they have lids. But whenever you're doing scenery, you're gonna wanna mix a lot of stuff. Spray bottles, we'll pause in a sec. Useful for applying. Um, oh no, I paused that in the wrong place. Whoa, let's go back to there. Um, there we go, let's pause it. So spray bottles. If you've ever watched me glue, and I talked about this last time, I always spray wet water first, and then I spray my glue, and finally I drip it on. So definitely spray bottles, the finest you can, and dripper bottles of all sorts, just so useful. And I'm just gonna tell you the joke. So Digger said, please hit the thumbs up. Yeah, guys, if you aren't subscribed, please subscribe. I'm only on 92 and a half thousand followers, and I'd love to get the 100,000 plaque and it's eking out at about 200 a month. So it's new subscribers. So I'm not likely to get there very soon. So if you're one of those people that's watching and not subscribed, it won't cost you anything. Just hit that button and get me a little bit closer to the 100,000, please. And then Timber Surf. There are three tools in the chat. He's getting his coat right now. So Timber says, cutting board is essential. Yeah, I hope it's on here. I have a sneaky suspicion it isn't because I don't remember seeing it. Um, it might have been on a different playlist than the one I put on here. Um, hi Raverson, nice to have you with us. Jeff Boyd, had a really good sanding block I picked up from Bunnings, though I seem to have placed it somewhere safe. Those safe places. So hard to, yeah, they're so safe, nothing ever gets found. Polite says, I made a metal file, needle file, even smaller. Now I can file mini holes to 0.5 millimetre and smaller. That is titchy. To be honest, I'd probably use a drill bit or something of that size, but that is very, very small. So, um, we're on spray bottles. I do, I, I buy eight or 10 at a time from Amazon and fill them. I also use the screw top bottles, the dropper bottles to put all my paint in. Cause I spray lacquers, you can pre-mix the whole can at once. So the little pots, they come in, they're like Tamiya pots, Mr. Color pots. I pre-mix those with one and a half um, lacquer thinner, Mr. Colour Leveling Lacquer Thinner, and I've got the colour mixed up, and they don't really go off or anything, so you can keep them in there for ages, and then when you want to put them in your airbrush, you just unscrew it and put it in. So I use bottles for all sorts of things, because they're just, it's not just glues, I have bottles of water to spray, I have bottles of um, like washes, acrylic washes to spray, so I do use them a huge amount. Okay, so Timber says subscribing costs nothing, unusual in this world, so take advantage. That is very true, thank you, yep. And then John says, have you ever used sanding string? I haven't. I think the thinnest thing I have is some sanding sticks, but it would be. So, Scale Model Craft says, I can't keep my spray bottles of PVA and water spraying. Any tips? I've tried alcohol etch. So, my top tips are for PVA spraying. Um, I thin it a lot. I put it about, I'm using matte medium quite often, um, not matte medium, gloss matte mod podge, uh, gloss matte mod podge, matte mod podge. I use that a lot. And I put about a sixth of it in a milk carton with water, shake it up and it's so fine, it really won't glue. But because of the first thing that I'm gluing, I mean, it will glue, but it, it, it you're not getting a lot. You have to drench it to get a lot of glue on. But because the first thing I'm gluing with it is generally um, tile grout with sand for my base levels, it's fine for that. And I've also used it to glue foliage and things, and it has worked. So I think the answer is go a little bit thinner than perhaps you're going and just perhaps put two or three fine layers of glue on to build up the glue instead of one thick drenching. The other tip, which I'm sure you're already doing, is at the end of every session, religiously, take it apart, put it in a, a cup of water, and spray clean water through your nozzle for a few minutes till your nozzle is clear of glue. And that way, there's no glue sat in your nozzle to dry. Um, so those are my two top tips. Thin more than you think you will need. I mean, my fine sprays won't spray it any thicker than that anyway. And then if you're thinking, oh, I haven't got enough on and you're doing things like rocks, small pebbles, um, you know, just like 
thick layers of base, use a dripper bottle to put the extra glue on because by that point you've sort of drenched the surface and it's well bedded down. So you can put extra glue on and then you could use like a third, two thirds water mix of glue and water and it will just sink in a bit better because you've already wet the surface. So that's my one. Norm says condiment bottles are cheap at the pound stores. Yeah, I like the ones with the screw top for the paints. Um, they, they are condiment bottles rather than the plastic caps. I just find they keep it a bit tighter. They don't evaporate as much. Andy T, mixing of small volumes of fluid. Would a Durex work as a disposable container? Really? You made me say that out loud. I don't know. Your problem. Um, I would personally use sauce bottles. Uh, sauce containers. So I have shot glasses and sauce containers for um, caps. So um, the sauce containers, are, they're kind of like salad sauce containers and you um, kind of, uh, they're about that big and they come with a, a cap, sometimes a flip cap, but sometimes a separate cap and the separate caps are quite useful. And I mix small stuff in shot glasses if I don't want to keep it because there's no lid or the little sauce containers. Uh, I've got mine off Amazon if you want to, you know, keep them. So scale model craft, I'm doing 50-50. I do the same type grout as you, thanks very much. Yeah, do it a bit thinner then perhaps and do spray. Timber surf, use household items, spray bottles, sauce bottles, yogurt pots, etc. X perfume room space for IPAs, it will not evaporate from them. It's a very good point. And um, I think window cleaners, some of those sprays are really good. Um, room sprays are often have had alcohol through. The one thing I found that trashed every spray it ever went in is Zappa. Um, so you can get cyanoacrylic Zappa. And I put it in a little bottle. Um, if I just scroll back from the magic of here, that bottle that's standing upright, you can't see me wave my mouse, but the bottle that's standing upright at the back with the little metal tip and the cap on, I used to put cyanoacrylate Zappa the liquid you could buy bottles of liquid and put it in that but it would evaporate out and I found it ate through the plastic that they used in the spray pump bottles so I've started to buy the builders aerosols just because they last right to the bottom of the can so greetings from someone who doesn't have a name no you really don't have a name. How did you get away with not having a name? Anyway, greetings from Colorado, USA. I'm John and just now subscribe to your channel. I enjoyed the five part tool video. Oh, thank you. And um, uh, thanks John for subscribing. Another one towards my 100,000. <sighs> we'll get there. So Timber says, check out your local pound dollar store for shot glasses, plastic cups, takeaway tubs. They're all really useful. And takeaway tubs. My dad had Meals on Wheels for the whole of lockdown, practically, because they did a volunteer service. And he had this like little small dessert pot with a plastic lid every day. And I had hundreds of him because you know, lockdown was quite long. And I, they were brilliant. I put tile grout and sand and stuff like that in them. And it keeps them in nice, useful pots because my really big pots of sand are all downstairs because there's like, you know, a building amount of sand in there. And, I, I, you know, I don't use more than that amount. So they're quite useful. And I can make up small amounts there, you know, for um, different projects. OK, so let us play. We have got to the bottom of chat talking about bottles. Who would know that bottles could be such a scintillating conversation? Um, so yeah, there we go. Some of my bottles I'm still going around. And we're on to brushes. Now, I do recommend a wide variety of brushes. You can see I have some fancy ones. They're Dale Rowney. Um, that I use those for miniature painting mostly. Um, or very fine. Actually, I don't use that big yellow one for miniature painting. But, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that came in a bulk pack. I tend to use 200. And then um, the orange ones are AK Interactive, but the one with a serrated edge is like a weathering brush. It's really knackered now. Um, and the serrated edge was supposed to make it easier to do streaks. And then I've got a couple of chip brushes, sort of uh, two inch and one inch, and they're great for scenery size stuff. Could you try painting a diorama base with one of those other brushes and it'll take you forever. And they're just normal. Um, one's a disposable brush from Hobbycraft, the one inch one. They're just like, you know, the cheap bag of brushes ones. I have got some foam brushes that are probably there as well. And yeah, you just, they're so useful. 
Um, and I just put a plug in here for health and safety. Do wear plastic gloves when you are doing dangerous stuff. Um, do wear the mask when you are doing spray painting. Look how dirty that is. That's my spray painting. It's an old one. I don't use it anymore. I've got a new one. Um, that's my spray painting. All that would be in my lungs if it wasn't on there. And I suspect there's a load more. So, and glasses as well. I don't generally wear them when I spray painting. And my old glasses, which I've kept to wear when I'm spray painting, they actually have white paint marks here where it has come over the top of that and hit the top of the glasses and they had spatters across them as well from spray painting so there we go so I don't think I've got knives cutting mats and tweezers for some reason so I'm just going to quickly talk about them and I need you all to imagine what they look like I do actually have a beautiful video of them somewhere and but knives I use two knives three knives exclusively one a number 11 exacto blade two a swan morton scalpel with a rounded number two blade i want to say um it's rounded and um three a box cutter and for anything big the box cutter is there the fourth thing in the picture that you can't see you're using your vivid imaginations here is a knife sharpener with a box cutter you know, knives can be expensive. With a number 11, if you want a sharp point, you want a sharp point, get a new blade out, they're not that expensive. On a box cutter, just sharpen it. You know, you can sharpen that on a sharpener. You know, they're like a long tube and you go with sound effects, back and forth, and you've sharpened your blade. And that is really, really useful for making your blades last forever. Really useful. Um, so there we go. Andy thinks I'm priceless. Oh, you can't afford me. Um, bless you, but thank you much for your videos. So there we go. Um, um, so that's knives. I use those three. I find I like the X-Acto blade holder the least because I find the metal ones undo themselves regularly and they're a little bit small and thin. You can get bigger, chunkier handles now. So if you're having problems holding those thinner, round ones, get a bigger, chunkier handle and um, it will be really good. You know, ergonomic and all that. Um, the second thing is a cutting mat. I have cutting mats everywhere and now I've got white work surfaces underneath. I am religious about them and I still get black marks under my cutting mats. And I bleach my white surfaces every time I take a cutting mat up. Um, but, you know, it's really important to have them you will trash your worktop i used to work on the granite in my kitchen and apart from some super glue that leaked when i had a model that was bigger than my cutting mats and i had two down and stuck it to the work surface and it took off the top of them with granite you can't really tell because there's one or two it's not you know granite is a natural rock so it always has one or two marks in it generally anyway at least mine does and um yeah but i've got one patch there but you can't really see it she says to herself i know where it is um, but I kept that mirror finish um, after working on it for, well, it went down in 09. So we're talking 14 years working on it. So, um, and the way I did that was using a lot of cleaning when I needed to. I clean it a lot. And also using cutting mats all the time. Self-healing cutting mats. Get A2 or A3, um, but A2 is better. Have a nice wide surface area. Um, and you know pile them up get them there as they get old you can scrub them you can put IPA on them to clean them off you get the nail brush on them give them a good scrub get them clean as they get old they won't be flat anymore so have a good one for cutting paper and card where those little bumps in it could cause issues and have a rough one for you I used to have a really messy one for painting and mum gave me a messy mat which is just like a plastic sheet which says messy mat on it and it's got grids on it. It's like a thick plastic. And I put that over it when I'm painting, you know, messy scenery painting, which helps. So there we go. Um, oh, and Timber's put up a video. If you're unsure how to sharpen blades, watch his video after this. Glad you put the after this in brackets, Timber. <laughs> but yeah, go check that out because um, there is a, a way to sharpen and I can't guarantee this. It, it's not actually quite like that. Hi Red Dog Terrain and hi Russ Rockino, Russ Rockino Railroad. Hey, nice. Oh, if I move there, it goes into focus. Oh, I must try that more. Um, so that's cutting mats. I have 
white work surfaces now and I have cutting mats down. I have them on the floor so I don't get my floor dirty. I drop stuff in my kitchen, which is where I've been working, and I've got brown paint spattered all over one of the worktop um, units. So, you know, you just need to be careful of your stuff. Um, hard floors are obviously easier to find things on, um, but if you're going to drop stuff on carpet, put a mat underneath your work area as well so that you don't damage or um, dirty your carpet. And then the final thing is tweezers. And this is where I wish I had my pictures. They're in two sets, so I may have a second set in a minute. But I love just, I had some little bent nose tweezers, which are so bent now, they're out of, like they don't really twi touch anymore. Um, but I have three sets of tweezers. I have the little medium sized bent nose ones. I have really fine point ones that just tend to bend if you touch anything too big. And then I have ceramic tip ones. And I use the ceramic tip ones a lot. Why ceramic tip? Well, they don't transfer heat. So if you're soldering, you don't get burnt fingers. And I just really like the ceramic tip ones. They're a nice size, shape and solid. So I bought ceramic tip ones. They're really, really good. Um, and then the um, sort of corollary to that is some stuff, tweezers just aren't strong enough. And I have a set of mini pliers I got years ago and they're about this big. And there's one that is just the basic normal plier needle nose they're obviously short needle nose because it's a and it's serrated and i use that so much so much but i've also gotten that set of pair of nippers which are also really useful don't nip anything like piano wire with them though there's a lesson um nippers and um sort of flat smooth ones so you don't damage surfaces but they're great for getting everything from your gunked up acrylic tube tops off tops generally, through to getting your clips out of your open lock terrain when they would come out. So I definitely do recommend you have those. But back to the videos. And they'll probably appear in a minute and I'll be like, oh, we talked about these. Um, so this is the hot glue gun. Um, I We talked about glue last time. I think hot glue guns have their place. I, I love and hate them at the same time because of the stringiness and because they're hot and I get blisters from them and all those sorts of things. But they're really great for quick tacking big areas of terrain. I never use them on anything small. Oh, no. okay. So now we're on to just base materials. And these are some of the materials I use. Bits of styrene, bits of card, bits of foam, styrene shapes, embossed styrene. Whatever it is that you're doing, somewhere along the line, you'll have to put a base surface down. And actually foam is what I use a lot of the time. If I'm not 3D printing it, then the foam, this is black craft foam, I get it on Amazon, and it's very dense, so you can carve it well. It takes a tool well, um, a hot tool especially. It is a bit hairy on the surface now, which I guess is the way they cut it. Um, so that can be a bit of pain, but you can stand that black um, foam really easily with a sanding block or emery board so it's definitely a useful thing to have is supplies of foam I had builders in and I have got so much out of the skip I actually had to I almost filled a skip when I emptied it out and then they threw it all around in my void when they worked out there so now I have a void of just foam everywhere which I need to sort but I haven't faced yet <sighs> big big sigh about demoralized tidying house moment because it all was incredibly neat and now it isn't um also out there are my suitcases and christmas stuff so it's just that's the only thing in the void um and foam lots of foam and rubble from the building work which all needs to get tidied because it was nice and neat out there and tidy and now it isn't so um that was basic materials you'll find whichever your favourite is and there's a few more to come don't worry and then the last thing I had on this I know these are a series of videos that I had as a basic material in my head was just the natural found stuff that you might find around because so much of what we do is oh I bought this whereas this stuff the the bark you can get out your garden I suspect I actually bought this one because it's square I did have a pile I got up my garden at one point and I think it went in the bin again later. Um, the little metal container is sort of the, the birch tree spacer for catkins and they're great for leaves. But that's the kind of detritus you can whiz up in a blender that you've got from the gutter. I used to pick that up, go around the gutter and just dry leaves and things like this and twigs. Really useful when you're doing scenery. 
So not everything that you buy has to cost a lot of money. And although I'm gonna show a lot of basic tools and materials, I put this in here to show you that some stuff you can just get for free. You don't have to spend a lot of money. My foam that I use all came out of Builder's Skips. Not, you know, it, I didn't pay for it at all. Um, coffee stirrers, you know, these are cocktail sticks. If you're American, you call them toothpicks, but cocktail sticks sounds far more glamorous. Coffee stirrers, uh, lollipop sticks or tongue depressors, I think they sometimes call them. I've got about five boxes of coffee stirrers my mum gave me for my birthday one year. She's a great mum. Um, so I've got like a thousand of them in each box. So I've probably got more than I'll ever use. And they're really useful, but you can also just get them for free from a coffee shop. And you use them for anything with wood on, wood sides. Um, even in HO, you can cut them up if you're not showing the side of them and use them. So loads and loads of things that you get are free. Now I use these, um, I use the cocktail sticks for applying glue and I use the others for mixing generally just paint plaster whatever it is that i'm mixing and they're really useful for that tile grout and sand if you want to use proper wood in as a material you can buy scale lumber and it costs a lot or you can cut up your own if you you know want to i've got tons that i bought just cheaply set off people when they were selling up stuff and i do recommend if you're going to do a lot of scratch building then you buy proper size wood sometimes. And then also in this pile of things that you might find useful, cotton buds, Q-tips I think Americans call them, not quite sure why, cotton buds and these are micro brushes. I use micro brushes all the time, I bought a few hundred of them and they use them in nail art now so they're actually really available on you know Amazon and other places. And they're very useful for taking out small errors in paintwork. I'll use them to mop up, applying a small dot of glue, perhaps. Um, let me just go back to that one. And um, cotton buds the same. I use them for cleaning up. I use them for applying pigments sometimes. Um, when it's a metallic pigment or something, I might use a cotton bud to put it on. Just loads and loads of different things that are applied and you're like, it doesn't really want a brush and then I throw them in the bin. So the single use plastics, you can get bamboo um, cotton buds if you're worried, um, or you can get paper ones now, I think. Um, and the micro brushes will no doubt be going over to that soon. But I bought these years ago and a few hundred will last you a long time. And next to my workstation, I've got two glasses with um, like micro brushes in. The um, cotton buds are in a hobby zone modular um, if I did my hand up in a place, you could see it just over there. They're actually just over there so I can reach them. And the cocktail sticks are also in a glass. So I have like three glasses there and the other one's got hot glue gun sticks in, if you're wondering. And some paints that I'm working on, I turn upside down when they're getting near the end of the bottle. So they're in there. Black grey, one of my favourite colours, is there. Oh, let's see what everyone's saying. Long nose pliers, says Timber. Yep, useful. Um, be wary of cheap Chinese supplies of extruded plastic. It could be very poor dimensionally. I can imagine that, yeah. I tend to use um, Slater's Plastic Card in the UK or Evergreen in the US. And for wood, there's Kapler and North Eastern and Mount Albert. And I think Fast Tracks has now taken over Mount Albert. So, um, yeah. Oh, and um, Russ has mentioned Plastruct as well. Yeah. Slater's Plastic Card is good in the UK. Um, if you're into this side of the Atlantic. Um, Timber says can't go wrong with evergreen and plastic. That's very true. They do good stuff. And they do a lot of shapes. So the um, embossed plastic card, which I showed, which was terracotta coloured, is brickwork. And you can get it in four or five different types of bond. So you can even get your bond of your bricks to match what you're doing. And I make sure I do that as well. Um, so there we go. And Timber has a video on those two, so go check out that one. I forgot out toothpicks. No, I've got toothpicks on there. I just called them cocktail sticks because it's fancier. They were on that list. Um, we saw them a, a few pictures ago. But toothpicks sounds like you pick your teeth with them, whereas cocktail sticks is glamorous and sounds like you're being a glamorous... Oh, I'm a cocktail drinker. And because I'm a woman, I'd rather drink cocktails. Anyway, there we go. And Norm says, no, we had cocktail sticks. Southeast Flying Cast is the other sheet supplier. Okay, I don't know them as well. So, so there's, there's a few big names in this and that's it. 
Um, Slater's Plastic Card, I tend to buy from them directly um, because they're in the UK. Um, but yeah. And then Andy T says, an old electronic toothbrush can be converted to a sander polisher. Oh, that's a nice idea. You can actually buy expensive versions of those brand new as well if you want to splash the cash. I actually took my last electronic brief toothbrush, which had broken, apart to see how it worked because I'm that kind of girl. <laughs> it was really cool. I actually wanted the charging unit from it. Um, but yeah, it's a really good idea. And someone has cottoned onto it and made an expensive version. I love Despy for some of the stuff they do. Um, they do do some really cool ideas. And they, they take some of these hobby ideas and make them. I've actually got a Despy electronic pen tool, while these are whizzing around, that is like a little rotary drill tool. It's really useful. And don't forget the humble kitchen towel. I have a hobby zone modular with one next to me. I use so much kitchen towel, whether it's for mini painting and wiping the paint off on it, whether it's for mopping up spills, or whether it's for actually putting into scenery as a tarpaulin, don't get wrong with holes, the holes always show, um, or um, using as a sort of base instead of plaster cloth, you can just put a bit of kitchen roll in and dump stuff on it. Whatever it is, the humble kitchen roll should not be underestimated, but double ply is often better than single on this type of thing. Um, oh, and then stating the obvious is plus one on the toothbrush hack. So these all are a bit mixed up because I wouldn't say this is a tool or material, but somehow I decided to put pigments in at this point. And I think it's because it's where it was in the cupboards. But I do think we, we've got paint to come, I suspect, in a different video. Um, so that's coming, a joy. But pigments is something I really use a lot of. And I notice that some different types of modelers use them a lot, like military and railways. Yeah, you go into sci-fi modeling or you go into fantasy miniatures and they've never seen a pigment in their life. And it's really bizarre how, you know, some of them are really popular and some of them aren't. So these are um, mostly military. And I mean, I some of these, these MIG ones um, here, I had those. 20 years ago, probably. They're probably not far off 20 years old. They went out of production and they've come back into production in that time. And MIG has set up three other companies, I think, in that time. So um, AK Interactive is the middle one. People sometimes don't like to buy them. We talked about it on a previous live stream because of their rather nasty um, book they put out promoting um, concentration camp type modeling. It's really weird and bizarre. I'm not gonna mention it again here. But if you just have normal chalks and pastels, when I started doing it, there's a green on the um, pastels there and a pink, a sort of pale, ready pink and loads of rust colours. No, nope, I need to go back. Whoops. So if you look here, these colours, um, that pinky colour, that ready pink, was for doing faded red oxide and you could just paint it on. The green was for doing moss and at the time, you couldn't buy pigments in any of those colours. I think there, you can now get green pigments, but nobody did them. The military modellers didn't do them. And I just went down a local art store and bought them. And these are all art store pastels. And I scraped them off with an X-Acto blade into a powder, reenactment, and that's it. And so you don't need to buy the expensive ones. So I have all the pots because they're really handy if you can find the colours, a good art store will have them. You want chalk pastels, not oil pastels, and you can get them in every tone. They're just so useful. And I apply them either with a brush over a matte varnish, don't bother over gloss, they just won't stick, or I apply them with a slurry of isopropyl alcohol and paint them on like a paint. The isopropyl evaporates, leaving the pigment a lot thicker than you would ever get it normally so it's useful for adding thick layers of pigment but it can still be manipulated with a brush it can be worn off and it's still if you don't like it you can just take water to it and get rid of the pigment it might stain an unprotected white paint for example but if you put the matte varnish on it, it may just hold a little bit in the matte varnish you may not get it all off but generally it will come off and I just find them so good for doing weathering if you're new at it and you don't know what you want to do. If you get them wrong, put them under a tap and wash them off. It's, or use a cotton bud soaked in water if it's something more, you know, small. And that's really cool. Um, so there we go. Andy, oh no, 
Um, right, Russ, I use napkins from the $1.25 store sometimes for senior cleanup. Has the dollar store gone up with inflation? Oh, that's sad. Night, Andy, you said you were going at nine, so see you later. Not really later, but see you next time. Um, ah, Lee asked, how would I apply the pigments? Got you there. And then, good night, Andy, it's 2 p.m. here. It's uh, 9.02 here, so um, there we go. I um, had a tutorial earlier with the, one of my people I do tutorials with. It's 8 a.m. for him, and it was like 2 in the afternoon for me. I was like, why are you bleary-eyed when he started so oh, I need caffeine. And I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, after lunch. Um, so that's so I would apply pigments sometimes with a cotton bud or with a brush um, if they're just dry. I'd apply them with um, a brush and a slow isopropyl alcohol just because it evaporates quickly. It's a nice carrier if I was doing them as a thicker colour and you can just take them off with water. You can get liquid pigments, which I've tried. They're okay, you know, they're okay. They ball up on a gloss surface again, so you do need a matte surface. But to be honest, rather than pay the amount for liquid pigments, I probably would just mix my own slurry, just me, because isopropyl alcohol helps it flow well and it sits nicely on surfaces with that. And then Scale Model Craft, what would you finish the pastels with? Just the same matte clear? That's a good question. If you're doing a diorama, I wouldn't seal them. Um, one of the advantages of pigments is they give you a beautiful matte finish. And if you're putting them over something that's a little, maybe a satin or something that has a different texture, you can get some real texture considerations going on there. Um, I've used them, just a hint. I did them over an oil paint once that was still a bit tacky. Um, I'd obviously not drained the oils off well enough and I'd used a wash and it was still tacky three or four days later and I wanted to get on. Went over with pigment, got rid of all the tackiness. Um, so I wouldn't seal them unless they're going to be handled. So that would mean I would seal a loco because they're going to be handled. I would not seal a building because you don't handle buildings. Um, so there we go. I, I tend, 90% of the time, I don't seal them. And if you put them on with isopropyl alcohol and sort of pigment, they're actually quite tough. It takes a lot to rub them off. So you can do that and they're fairly tough enough for you to build the rest of the structure and not worry too much. Um, if you're doing them on, um, you know, just uh, a model that's going to be handled a lot, you have to seal them. But if you do, you might have to put three or four coats of the pale ones on because they all but disappear. And the black ones then get left and what could appear like quite a nice grey effect and suddenly become quite a lot darker. It darkens them down as well when you spray them. You know how your earth goes darker when it rains? Dust goes darker, the roads go darker. It's the same with pigments, it's that effect. David Orth, evening all. If you're in Europe, little regularly do cheap art sets, including chalk pastels once or twice a year. They're also good for all sorts of inexpensive useful modelling tools. That's really cool, yeah. I mean, you could use pigments to colour so many things um, you know if you're doing um, like an earth area and you just want to put a, a road for example you want a dark street down the middle of your road chalks or pigments perfect for that but chalks are cheaper charcoal as well sometimes people use also very cheap um, if you want to put if you're doing an earth area and you know when things get compacted and drier they often lighten in colour you can go over your base earth colour which for me would be tile ground so it's got a bit of bite to it go over it with a bit of pigment and it doesn't give you the same effect as paint it gives you a more earthy effect so i think for scenery pigments are better than paint in many instances and um, so yeah so that's good to know i never go into little i guess there isn't one that close to me I mean, there's one in Shirley, but it's not that close. So I just never go there. So let me keep playing. Um, so that's pigments. This is in a really random order, isn't it? It gets very ordered in a minute, don't worry. And we're only eight minutes through an hour long video. So um, I better speed up a bit on some of these. Some of them are a bit um, like very, very tuned in to specific types of things and we'll get there in a sec. Um, so yeah. Wow, and uh, scale model craft, glad I could help. I, you know, I sometimes think I'm a bit of an, you get that imposter syndrome. And then I was talking to someone the other day and I was just like, no, actually, and he was just getting into 
doing scenery on model railways, if that. And I was just like, wow, I just, I forget how much I know. So we're now on painting tools and um, materials, which is why these things weren't in, the pigments were separate there, because I don't see them on here because they're not paint. Makes sense now. Um, yeah, Norm, it says model railroaders love pastels to weather their rolling stock and locos. I've got pan pastels as well, which is slightly more oily. And um, yeah, oh, and Jeff is off. 6 a.m. time to prepare the hand over the day shift. Bye, Jeff. Not glad you could make it. So let's talk paint. First of all, paint. Artist acrylic paint. I use artist acrylic paint for most things that are big because it's fairly cheap. Not as cheap as, say, emulsion for the walls. Latex, I think Americans call it. Um, but, you know, it's fairly good. I actually buy them in bigger containers. I buy the big round, um, sort of that size artist ones in raw umber and white, black. I've got some reds and some burnt siennas and those sorts of colours and lots of natural. I have a buff titanium or natural, depending which brand you're on. And I use those a lot. And the reason I use them a lot is because they're very... Um, um, cheap but then they're quite densely pigmented and you can see there the heavy body ones that liquitex one have even more pigment so they're like my my general duty scenery paints now obviously for my big stuff i've got um, walls and ceilings paint here from valspar i think that was a that was a green i used on my layout for something and i used it so it it got its own tub because I was going to use a lot of it. If you're going to do a, a sky colour, worth getting them custom mixed because you'll never find the right blue in the normal ranges. If you're going to do a, an earth colour that's pretty specific, it can be useful to have something really mixed up that's right. So you can mix your own big paints as well for emulsion for the really, really big stuff. Um, so that's cool. And, and hmm, well, what else have we got coming on? I'm, it's some beautiful, like, going back and forth, but I don't know when I'm going to pause on one because I haven't memorised them. So I'm just going to keep talking about them and hopefully at some point we can just squeeze through. So let's just see what the next one is that we're going to look at. Ha! Oil paints. So let's pause there for a sec. So um, when we're on the art store type of paints, you know, I also use oil paints a lot. I use these for washes. I've, I've got a big mix of brown and black acrylic washes, which are made from inks and medium. And I did a video on washes, magic in a bottle, where I gave the recipe. But actually, I would, I've would i also got mixed up an entire condiment bottle about this big of Starship Filth, which is a dark grey black oil wash. And it's mixed with odorless thinners so it doesn't smell. Um, and I splosh those on a lot because I absolutely adore my oil washes for the way they sit. They're the same as enamels. So if you do an enamel wash, they're more or less the same. They're not quite um, as smelly. And I just love them because they're great. But they're not water-based. So I probably wouldn't use them in scenery until right at the end where I can then leave it a week or two for it to go off because it takes a long time for these particular oil washes just to go off. And you put them on a bit of card first. I've done that in a few of my videos now. And the oil comes out and you're left with the more pigment, which will dry quicker and less glossy, which is one of the problems. You'll get gloss on an oil paint because it's quite a glossy paint if you're not careful. But I do have to recommend them if you're doing anything that's um, like a mini. I really love them or a, a model like a plastic kit. They really love them for that. So let's just see what else I've called out in the boxes. Ah, here we go. Um, so we've talked about the one at the top, which is the walls and ceiling paint. Washes, uh, another set of washes is enamel washes. Now these MIG washes, this MIG neutral wash is my all time favorite wash color. It's kind of a sludgy brown. I've had this one and topped it up with more mineral spirits because I do it quite dilute. I don't shake it that much, so it comes out a sort of lighter strength, not as strong. You know, people say, oh, my washes are too strong, I have to dilute them. I'm like, don't shake it as much. Maybe it's just me. 
Um, and I love that mink. It went out of production again for about 10 years. It's back in again. It's my favorite color. They also do a dark wash that I like. And it's just great for adding depth, crack. But these, the reason I like the neutral wash, it looks like dirt. It's a dirt color. So you can put it on and get a dirty tone to some surfaces. So that's really, really good. Um, and then the panel liner is a great way of, it comes with a minute little brush. You can use it straight out of the bottle. It's square, so it's hard to knock over. You still can knock these bottles over. I did it with my Tamir Extra Thin Cement the other day, um, but it's great. I've got this in that particular Tamir in black, dark gray, gray, medium gray, light gray or something, and um, white and one other color, brown. And I love them. They're really, really good. I notice AK Interactive have brought out a panel line set now, and I think ammo from MIG will be. Everybody in that European manufacturers for military stuff have jumped on this bottle shape. They had loads of washes and panel lines before, but they're in their little round ones. They've all jumped onto this square shape with a brush in it bandwagon recently, so you might be able to get them more recently. But I go with the OG. This is the Tamir one. It's really great stuff. So Russ Rocking O Railroad. I have a campsite and nature trails on my layout. How do you glue down dust and dirt without darkening the trail? When I glue, the darkened colour no longer looks realistic. It has no dusty look. Short answer, I would not glue it. I would, perhaps if you're worried about it coming, I mean, what are you going to, if you're not going to touch it, dust it on and don't worry about it. It's not going to get handled. It's a scenery trail. Then literally don't, don't worry about it. Just dust it on and leave it. Um, you know, there's no reason to glue everything. It's going to get dust on it soon enough. If you do want to just give it a little bit more bedding, bedding down because you're worried it is dusty, a spray with isopropyl alcohol will temporarily and slightly darken it, but not as much as if there's glue in there. And it will tamp it down a little bit and give it a bit more sticking power than just neat dust. Um, but I would put it on and then hoover the excess off if you're worried. Um, about excess dust just sitting there and then just leave it like that. I wouldn't wouldn't seal it because you will lose most of that dusty look and you've put it on to get dust. I think people over seal on scenery where it's not handled like dioramas or railways where it's at the back and not handled. Um, obviously at the front of a layout or round yards where you're running stuff it's a different matter you may want to but I just do isopropyl alcohol then it down. Norm says, if you have a favourite colour acrylic paint that only comes in small containers, you can take them to your big box paint store and they'll run a bigger batch for you, cheaper in the long term. That's very true. Um, I use warm grey and it does come in a container, yay big, and I have a couple of them because I bought it twice by mistake. Um, I do love um, that, but, you know, it's a different type of paint when it comes in um, from the paint shop in the pre one. It's the one in the back here. Valspar. It's a different type of paint, but it still is a paint and it's great for mixing in. I always have raw umber as my standard because it's fairly consistent across different paint brands. And I'm and that's my raw earth colour on everything so that it matches the tar grouts and everything matches through. But it's a really great idea. Stating the obvious, brush over the trail with a light pastel tool using a flat brush. Yeah, that's, that's just the way. Um, and then... Tamsin says you can mix in some pale grout before gluing. That's a great point, Tamsin. I often use grout as pigments, and I should have said that before, because it's cheaper. So if I want to do pigment, like dusting of trails and stuff, or, you know, putting a dark colour on roads, or putting dusty dirt effects into the corner of buildings, instead of using pigments, which can get expensive, even if you use the chalk pastels, I often just use tile grout. It's already my earth colour because I've already done my earth with it and I just put the tile grout in and it works really well because it just matches through. And because it has a slight amount of cement in it, if you spray it with water, it will glue itself, more or less. So you can spray it with a bit of Mod Podge as well if you want to dilute. But yeah, it's a great point. And you can get blacks and greys to go on um, sort of um, the greys are great if you're doing yard areas that have got cinders you know ash if you want to do that so some great colors out there um, I found I wanted a terracotta and it, I couldn't get a terracotta though I went in my local tile store and there's loads of packets there I couldn't get a terracotta online it was the middle of lockdown and I used um, it's actually um, mosaic tile grout came in a small packet 
So you can get small packets as well as the big ones if the big ones are getting a bit pricey for you. Um, Russ says I will have to vacuum my layout occasionally, so I'll try the alcohol method. To be honest, if you've got a bumpy surface like a tile grab finish or a rough finish for your soil, um, which I would recommend that you have some kind of soil finish on those areas for your trails, it's not actually going to vacuum much off when you vacuum, even if you haven't sealed it. So you should be fine there. Um, it's just the way it goes. Right. Two and a half hour. Was it two and a half? Three and a half hour tutorial this afternoon and my voice will be gone. OK, what exciting thing am I going to ring next? Have we done the spray paints? Here we go, spray paints. So I am a great convert to spray paints in my later years. I mean, I do love my airbrush. Who am I kidding? I hate my airbrush, but I love what an airbrush does. I hate having to clean it. Though since I've moved to lacquers, I now have a very stinky um, room, which I seal and vent externally and have to wear a mask for, which is better. And I spray lacquers and my airbrush doesn't clog anymore and it sprays beautifully and I love it. Um, but actually, if I can spray can, I'll just do that to save having to clean my airbrush because I'm very lazy. So I use Halfords, which is a UK brand, car automotive spray primers. And I use their matte black paint and their grey primer and their red primer. And I use them as a basis. So grey goes on most things, red goes on brickwork and black goes on everything that needs to be dark. Now, if I'm spraying a model rather than scenery, um, like a specific model, then I will often use Tamiya Fine Grey because it's a finer spray. But if I'm spraying minis or small figures, it's going to be airbrush all the way. And I will use Mr. Surfacer 1500 grey in or white or black or brown or pink. Pink is for underneath yellow and oranges and gives it a lovely glow. If you put grey under yellow, you get almost a green colour. So I will airbrush minis and delicate plastic detail parts and anything that I'm going to oversaturate. But if you watch me whenever I'm doing my terrain videos with 3D prints, 3D prints, FDM especially, are big by comparison, and they are all just Halford's car primer. I do have a couple of other brands. I've got some Montana I picked up from Hobbycraft, but I found it really thin. So I tend to use Cobra, and I bought myself a little spinny thing that goes on the end of your drill. So you just go with your drill, and it spins the paint, and you can twist it to get the ball to go round. But um, that's a really cool way of mixing them. 20 seconds with that is better than my shaking it. And I really, so I use Cobra for some colours. So if I'm base coating, like I did my Shatterpoint terrain, I base coated it in dark brown Ibano um, Cobra. Did my desert buildings, I just did one coat with the, two coats maybe, you know, one coat with the Cobra spray desert colour and then put a brown acrylic wash over. Job done most of the time. So I'm converting over to primers because I'm doing a lot more terrain that's really big and I wouldn't even get some of my terrain pieces in my airbrush booth, but I do, and it's an A3 one. It's quite big, it's almost as high as my cabinet above it. So, you know, it's a big one, but I just can't fit the stuff in. You know, big spaceships, nightmare like they're gonna fit. So they all go outside, especially FDM prints that have already got loads of layer lines. So they're not gonna be as detailed and they get sprayed with this. So I'm a great fan of car pri primer, you know, the car paint primer for anything, or just normal spray paints for anything. Now I read on the side, and I sprayed in the rain, and I did have problems with it, but I read on the side of the Cobra ones that they're made for spraying in humidity as well. So you may find it, you've got to find a brand, I think they're nitro lacquers, nitro acrylic lacquers or something. You've got to find a brand that will spray well if you live in a high humidity area outside but I've sprayed in the rain practically and Halford seems to go through everything it's cellulose based it does stink um <laughs> Norm says maybe a two-parter Kathy Halford's for the win I go in and I buy about an armful of cans and then I come away because you can't ship them um from Halford so you have to go in so over lockdown I went to two shops almost the whole of lockdown. One was Halfords, the other was Hobbycraft. <laughs> That's me. That's where I went. Tesco's, no, nope, they deliver. Everywhere else, they deliver. Halfords, ha, oh, they don't deliver. Hobbycraft, well, I'm at Halfords. I'll just go into Hobbycraft. It's opposite. Um, 
So there we go. Um, the other thing when you're hoovering your layout, just put a tights pantyhose, if you're American, over the um, end of your hoover so you don't bring anything up. That'd be really cool. Right, so we've done spray paints. We have done, let's just whiz through there. That was the spray paints. What else have we got here? Brushes. We've talked a bit about brushes. You can see more of the brushes that I've got there. And then sponges. Now, the reason I've just put sponges on there, there's natural sponges and normal sponges. They're great for added like worn weathering uh, on the sponge technique. That's what the rusty colours are. You can dab them on and just get a bit of like a chipping effect with them. But they're also great for adding mottled colours onto surfaces for like tarmac and things like that. Just add a bit of mottling colour on because there's a pattern when you splush with them on. So I do use them a bit. The natural sponge is a little open sometimes, but it can be useful. And then the final tool is the airbrush. Now I just said I have a love-hate relationship with mine and I spray lacquers. I can't advise you to spray lacquers if you can't invent externally and you're not willing to wear the um, big mask because the stuff is really not good for your health. But if you do want to spray the most buttery smooth sprays without clogging your airbrush, lacquers are easier. They are definitely easier. And I only really got any good at airbrushing when I moved over to lacquers. And if you're gonna spell in metallics, I do think metallic lacquers beat everything else hands down. A gloss black, all clad lac um, metallic over the top, they're aqua gloss, job's done. I did it for my Mandalorian big sixth figure and it's really, really good. I do love it. So there we go. Um, and then Polite says, the small egg-shaped concealer sponges are ideal for working with decals. Well, I guess I tend to use a cotton bud. I guess my decals are smaller than yours. But yeah, you can just use it to even out the decal a bit. Get the water out from underneath so it sits nice and flat. So let's see how we're going. All right, I think that's everything on there. So these are bases, and I said I'd talk a bit more about some of the other things coming out. So bases. Um, I said that I've got a huge amount of my foam out the skip. And um, let's see which foam comes up first. Here we go. It is the skip foam. So this is the type of foam I'll get out the skip. It's Celotex, or whatever its brand name is, and it's a PIR foam. It is the sort of um, name they call it. And it doesn't cut with hot tools. You have to use a knife. It's very powdery, but it's free. It's great for building up rough cross sections. It's really quite cool. Um, it, it, it's um, take the foil off if you need to do any train stuff on it because it will conduct electricity and you might get shorts. Um, I've seen it happen on the Great Model Railway Challenge. But otherwise, I leave the foil on until, unless I'm going to carve it. And for this, I use kitchen knives to carve it or normal knives. Um, you can use a Dremel. You can use sanding. You can sand it. So it's all the usual ways of dealing with foam. But it is mask jobby. It's really irritant, the um, dust off it. And you do need to be careful. Um, so that is, um, that's a really cool thing. The next type of foam is XPS foam, which is expanded polystyrene. And I use these denser ones, but you can get slightly more open ones for insulation. It's a bit of a struggle in the UK because most insulation that you see for free is the Celotex variety, the PIR foam, not the XPS foam that cuts with hot tools. I guess because of its fire safety, though apparently the PIR foam will go up in flames as well if you put enough heat on it. Um, it's just obviously something to do with the price and whatever. But you can buy these types of craft foams from, I get this from, funnily enough, it's called Blue Craft Foam or something, um, on um, Amazon. It's black now. And I buy that and it comes in different widths. It's really useful and different sizes. And I've used, and I've got loads um, built up over the years. Um, and then this is white poly styry the expanded bubbly stuff i don't use it as much because but it will work with hot tools as will the blue black stuff and um, which is the big advantage of it but it is messy you want your vacuum cleaner going because it tends to boil a bit more and both of them with the hot tools put out fumes so you probably should be wearing your mask because it is pretty nasty fumes and these are organic solvents rated masks 
So the hot tool cutters, these are hot wire factory. My knife is bent and not that hot, so it doesn't work that well, but the wire one works incredibly well. I also have a Proxon foam cutting table that I barely used. I bought it for a project and it was invaluable for that one project, but I've barely used it since. But that is great if you're gonna do a lot of like walls with um, stones and you have to cut all the stones because it will cut the same thickness. And shifting lands or something has some really great tools, MDF tools you can use with it. I did print some 3D print tools for it, but the sad thing is that if you get the hot wire onto them, they snag because it just melts the plastic. You don't get that with um, if you're using MDF or wood. But I just struggle a bit to get neat cuts with the hot wires, if I'm honest. Um, all of them. It's about getting the right temperature and getting it sorted. Um, so I often end up sanding, is probably what I would do. Um, there we go. So let me just um, pause that a sec. Um, on chat, another top saving for a bit. This is from Norm. Go to your big box hardware store and go to the tile department. There you'll find big sponges to wipe the ground down after tiling. Cheap. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, big tiling sponges or something. And then it's a good... Um, and you can get wipe the grout down after tiling. Yep, that's useful. So next up on my list is Sculpt Mold. This is my favourite modelling, bulking out bases compound. And I, you can mix a bit of paint with so it doesn't go white. So if you chip it, it won't be white. But it's got some fluffy cellulose mixed in with some kind of plaster effect. So it sets fairly solid. The new ones set a lot quicker than my older ones, which I had a lot of working time on. And it sets lightweight though. It sets rock solid if you're not careful, but it sets quite lightweight. So you can um, not get the weight that if you'd put a pure plaster layer down. It's quite good for that. I do like it. It's easy to shape, firms up. It's great stuff. Um, and then my favourite base for a diorama is a picture frame. I have loads of them. Hobbycraft do half price sales and I buy them there. I've got them in really small ones for figures, big ones for this sort of, you know, dioramas. My biggest ones are kind of like this sort of size. They're so useful. I flip them round, take the glass out and put the hardboard at the top where the glass was and brilliant, really, really good. Put maybe a bit of foam in to pad them up, a bit of sculpt mould and you're done. That is just, it's just so useful. So, Russ Rockin says grout sponges. Oh, and this is plaster cloth. I use this a different way to most people. I don't drape it in water and drape it there. I tend to put it on dry and then spray it with water. Um, and it all, it, it stays more rigid that way. So you can use it to build up areas that, without as much support underneath. Um, so I tend to do it that way because it's less messy. I'm not dripping water everywhere. I have done it the dip it in water and put it on method. But plaster cloth used for bandages, etc. You can actually get the bandage ones now as well as the ones for art. Really useful for building up thin without requiring a lot of weight put on them. Hillsides on model railways and things. Or um, just, yeah, that's where I've used them. And I, these are ones I've still got. They last a long time. Um... David Orff says XPS is extruded polystyrene, EPS is the white expanded polystyrene. That's good to know. Um, Doc Roberts says I use Owens Corning XPS a lot for anything. I'm guessing you're American because that's not a brand we get over here particularly. Um, and then Timber says XPS is hard to come by in the UK as it's not fireproof and so not allowed in wall insulation. I've seen it done on some floor stuff. But that's why I end up with the expensive stuff on Amazon. And I use that a lot because it's actually denser than the... I had some old stuff before the rules changed and you weren't allowed to buy it anymore. Well, you can't buy it easily in any of the DIY stores. And it wasn't as dense and you could dent it by leaning on it. But these, the blue and the black one is much firmer. So it's a better one anyway. Russell Rockin says he loves sculpt mold. He's in good company. So Daz Clay... I use this to build up groundwork of embedded track, flat areas, areas where I want to put in small little puddles and build it up that way. The Terrain Tutor does an excellent video on how to do Daz Clay so it doesn't crack. If you're going to use it at all, go watch that. Terrain Tutor, brilliant video. I'm not going to repeat it, but you know, it's all about getting your ground wet, making sure everything goes onto a wet surface and putting wet cloths over it so it dries nice and slowly. Really great video. Um, you know, he knows his stuff. He's also written a really great book. 
that was on a Kickstarter that I bought as well, but I haven't read much of yet. So, so those are what I use for bases. And you can see these are now in chapters. Um, and ooh, the next chapter is Earth. Now, you might not need all of this stuff. You may already have got your bases. But my Earth is very, very simple. <laughs> I use a lot of tile grout. So I have tile grout, tile grout, and tile grout, basically. Mostly tile grout. Um, yeah. Um, so tile grout. We've got beige, great for sand. Mix it with sand, because sand itself is a little bit too big in texture. Or brown. Um, that might even be a walnut. You can get a taupe. You get loads of colours. If you go down your shop, you'll find one that matches the soil better. And I love tile grout. I've done a whole video on tile grout, my favourite scenery product. So if you want to know more about tile grout, go look at that. But I have it in every colour. And it is just a magic project product for earth. Okay, um, Doc Roberts, that's sand, that's just silver sand, um, you don't want to build the sand because it's orange, silver sand is paving sand, is another name in the UK, silver sand. Um, so Doc says most XPS is used in flooring but most they buy is 25 PSI but you can get it in 14, 60 PSI. We don't even do PSI on ours that I know of and we wouldn't be in pounds per square inch because we're British, we'd have some other weird continental management on it probably. David says the EPS is legal to buy in the UK but not for wall insulation. You can get it for heated floor insulation typically up to 30 mil thick and that's where I've seen it is floor insulation I will admit. So that's XPS yeah you're right David. And Tamsi says for XPS in the UK one supplier if you need one to lot is panel systems. They sell it in large sheets of boxes of 60 by 60 panels. I think I bought some from them as well in the past but it was quite expensive. So this is um, slate, okay? That picture is slate from a garden center. It came in a bag, yay big, called something like slate flour. It's really, really fine chippings. And you can sieve it down using a variety of garden sieves all the way down to a tea strainer to get everything from flour, like a flour texture, all the way through to big chunks. And I use it a lot in um, sort of slate, I guess. But when I came to do Dinoric slate, it was the wrong colour. So I ended up using a different slate that I had. And you can buy slate ballast and even finer slate sometimes as well. And I got some from Continental Models or something, which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and I bought all my silk floor tufts and stuff from them years ago. But slate was definitely very much the... Um, a niche product but if you want it the garden centre is a place to go and it can be useful just to put in some kind of rock but to my mind it is just a bit too distinctive as slate so I don't use it perhaps as much as you might think instead I tend to use woodland scenic talus if I'm doing streams because woodland scenic talus is rounded it's blown up it's the stuff they use in hydroponics so it's rounded like pumice um, just like you would see in the bottom of a riverbed this is garden soil. It's not my garden soil. It's topsoil that my mum bought because my garden soil's solid. It doesn't look anything like that. Um, and it's really nice. It's very sandy because she bought it. It's a better quality. Um, but you still need to sieve it. I used it on my dagger bar and then my resin reacted with it. So just a warning. I used it under my snow diorama. Goodness knows why, because it didn't show in the end. I was going to have it showing in places and it didn't. And it made all my snow go yellow. So then I had to take all the snow off, reseal it and then put it down. So just note to watch when you use some things that what goes on top is also important. Um, Norm says, Targrat is cool because it's basically self-gluing. That's why I get away with such a thin spray of um, Matt Mod Podge because I've got cement in the Targrat. Um, Russ says he uses it for some road and trail bases. Ah, so these are tools. These are tools to put on your tile grout and they're both from Precision Ice and Snow. One's their old metal one and they're like very fine meshes. And the other's their modern one that says um, Precision Ice and Snow around the outside actually. And I use them for shaking on. You could use a flower shaker or something else um, because they also come in a handy pot and you can put it on the end. I think Luke Towen did that having chatted to him about it. 
he, he asked about the sieves. And there's the Woodland Scenic Palace that's this rounded. It comes from like fine up to extra coarse. I buy it in natural and I paint it the right colour. And I use it a lot for riverbeds because it's just perfect for that. Um, so David Orff, I'm lucky to live near pools. Sandbanks Beach Town is incredibly fine. Oh, Sandbanks Beach, lovely beach. David, are you stealing sand? It's owned by the National Trust, David. Oh, how could you? Do they not come and tell you off? And then finally, uh, another thing you can use to add a bit of variety, not as a building product, but on the surface, is something like blended turf from Woodland Scenics. Um, and this is very old, because look at the price of that. It's so cheap now. Um, and it's earth blend. It's got a hint of green, a bit of yellow and red thrown in there. But it adds a little bit of almost veg, but almost earth, just that start of things. Useful for throwing in corners if you've got a crack at the base of a building. Uh, useful products just to have around are there. Basically, they're blended turfs. Thanks, John. He just said great video. That's really cool. Um, so there we go. I think that is it. We're on to rocks. I said it would speed up and it is going to speed up. So for rocks, um, I have done a number of methods for the book. When I wrote my book, if you haven't bought it, please go buy it. Building Model Railroad Scenery by Kathy Millett, available on Amazon and Comeback. I did some stuff for the first time and I'd not done a huge amount of plaster cast rocks. So I had a go with wooden scenics mold. I had one or two, but I'd never really done a huge amount. So I brought quite a few of them over the period because they're very useful. And because they're identical, you want to break them up and buy a few varieties of them. I tried making my own rocks from foil. I sucked it. Other people make it look really good, but mine just looked like wrinkled foil rocks. So I wasn't that happy, but you can use foil to make rock molds and then pour the plaster into them. And then I looked at, okay, so I've got the bought molds um, and other people than Woodland Scenics do them. I think Nock and a few others do them. I tried making the foil molds. I have actually in the past made rubber molds myself using layers of rubber over coal, I think I used. And then you put something in them like lightweight hydrocal. And the reason you use hydrocal is do not use lightweight hydrocal. This stuff was crap. It just crumbled. It was awful. It was really, really bad. Use the proper hydrocal, um, not that one. And it, um, it's really lightweight and it sets rock hard. So it's really useful for those. And it holds really fine detail. It's like a dental plaster. So it's good um, from that point of view. And I'm sure it's just a standard thing you can buy in big bags. But I've just always used the Woodland Scenics. But I also tried pushing some things like silk clay and foam clay from Hobbycraft in there. And the silk clay is good. The foam clay is little bobbles for some reason. It's like not what you'd expect. But the silk clay is actually quite nice and you can push it in and just leave it to dry. It shrinks a bit. And as someone said, you can put it in the freezer if you want to speed it up. Put it in the freezer until it sets solid and then you can demold it and leave it on the side to actually set because it kind of air cures. But those silk clays, um, cosplay foam clay um, is more expensive than the Hobbycraft stuff. But I had some of that and I used that. And actually they worked really well. They were really lightweight. They were sadly bright pink or something. But it was a really great way of doing it. So I definitely recommend trying out things other than hydrocal. Tried Sculpt Mold, that was a bust, it really was. Um, but I tried all these other ones pushed in and you have to push them in, um, but they work really well. Resin, I tried as well, it didn't work as well. And the reason for that is you need to keep swooshing it. And if you've got a 10 minute setting one, it's not too bad to swoosh it. But the reason I didn't find it worked so well was it was quite thin around the top and quite thick at the bottom. So you could really do is rotor casting it or something to get it nice and thin and crisp. And what a lot of people do is they do a thin skim and almost, you know, swish it around on a really quick setting one. And then they put in a foaming one behind to fill it out to give it a bit more strength. Um, but the reason I pause this, you can make rocks just out of foam and carve them. And I've done it. I think this foam is too delicate and you end up having to put on a lot of layers of something like a thick PVA glue to try and keep it from 
um, dusting. So if you just touch it, if you paint it just this and don't seal it at all, when you touch it, it will literally just, the, it will come off. It, it's not a very solid surface, it's quite dusty. So what you need to do is go over it with a sealant, like a PVA or something, three or four coats at least of one of the thick, you know, the, not the really runny watered down one. Um, you use a runny watered down one to do the first coat to get it in all the cracks or something, and then go over and thicken it up to seal it. Something like that, and PVA is cheap, which is why I say PVA. Um, but you can carve it. I just struggle to carve it in big sections to look realistic. The other thing I struggle with that people seem to use successfully is bark. To my mind, it looks like bark, but it's on the list because some people make really great rock work out of bark. I'm just like me and my foil moulds. Didn't work for me. So, let's have a look. So, let's have a look. Who have we got? Ha! <laughs> Norm, I'd never steal from the beach, but it gets everywhere, so I just don't shake it out of the rug until I get home. A good sized pot each time. It's very true. Very, very true. It does get everywhere. And it's illegal to take it from Chesil Beach. Yeah, that's why I was surprised at because the National Trust are quite vindictive about keeping these things there. Doc Roberts says, some rock and sand I get are for aquariums and reptiles. I actually think there's probably a bag on the last video of aquarium gravel that I had in but I never really talked about because I've never used it. I do use chinchilla dust as well which is for reptiles and it's just like a coarse sand so it's quite useful from that point of view. Let's see what everyone said. Um, so yeah if you some fine swimming pool filter sand works if you need fine grit. We don't really have as many swimming pools over here as in hotter countries so I've never really seen swimming pool filter sand, but wow, that's one to add to the list, I guess. Um, Norm says it's a great book. Thanks, Norm. I'll pay you later. Um, and then Phoenix Knight says, good evening from Minnesota in the US. Evening. Um, I've been scared to make rocks, but I'm wanting to try to make it from foam. In that case, um, have a go at carving and just don't forget to seal them to give them a bit of rigidity. Um, and remember, you can sand, you can use a Dremel, you can use a sanding tool, you don't have, you can use a hot tool, but you can use an emery board to round off mistakes, you can chisel them out with a box cutter, loads of different ways, you just need to find the one that suits the rock that you're doing. Some people slash like mad and then just lever out the excess. I've seen so many people do great carving, it's just not a skill I've really acquired well yet is carving it, I have to say. Um, but, you know, it's great. I, I've seen some really beautiful rocks done with it. So it's definitely really high quality if you can just master that. David Orff, I have a friend who loves going to the beach. So I'll just take the opportunity. It's a good opportunity. Russ uses dirt from his own backyard sometimes. Now, what I will say is my dirt in my back garden, because I'm in the UK and we have gardens, is too rich in loam so it's very dark um, when you look at dirt around quite often it's paler and that's why i use tile grout because we I, my gardens had loads of um, organic matter put into it and it's the organic matter making it darker so it's the wrong color for where i model um, but if you've got the right color in your garden that's perfect um, and Timbers Link, my book. That's really sweet. I mentioned it on a Discord and had two people bought it last week and one person was reading it because it was raining in the Midwest earlier. So exciting. Um, so good to have you here. Dr. Robert says, plaster. I always use liquid dye for cement to add colour depending on the layout. It makes it easier to colour match the paint. That's very true. And liquid dye for cement is something I've never used, but I can imagine it's really useful for this. Um, I just mix in acrylic paint if people are wondering, or you can use inks. Phoenix Knight, I build dioramas, but because I'm worried to wreck them, I've used real ones that I found around my town, but then it gets too heavy. Yeah, uh, real anything, rock work, can be very, very heavy. What you can do is make a cast of them using rubber. You can paint on brushable latex and make a cast of them, and then put in some plaster instead, which will make it lighter, or buy some rock moulds as well is another thing. And um, Doc says add PVA in the mix. I think he's talking about when he's doing cement to, to go on the layout. I add PVA into my tile grout mix. Um, if you've ever seen it, P 
PVA stops it cracking if you put it on thickly and gives it some chip protection. It's really useful. Um, Norm says, Phoenix Knight, check out the, the YouTube channel Thunder Mesa by Dave Meeks. Lots of great tutorials on foam rock, cutting foam, forming, building rocks and foam. He is amazing. Yeah, great recommendation there. And Raveson Express says, see Thunder Mesa Studios to see how to make rocks and foam. He makes very nice stuff. I think that's a jinx there. Two votes for him. Definitely worth doing it. He is beautiful. Well worth watching. Um, David Orr, I presume it's my book he's talking about, says, it's a good book. Got the first week it came out. Thank you so much. Now, I did five minute um, starting scenery course on many of these areas. So if you think I've gone fast now, not to worry because um, we're not actually going to make the end of this. So I'm just going to whiz through quickly. Grass, I've got a video on it, but basically you can use a Stoy grass knot applicator and it works because it's nylon and it affects the nylon static grass and puts a charge on and it will do static short grass really well but if you're looking at static grass and you want to get serious there's big applicators and then there's little applicators from places like WWS that are cheaper um, and you need an applicator to get it to stand upright so you desperately do need something unless you want your grass sitting down um, you can use normal PVA glue or a grass glue. Grass glue stays tacky for longer, which gives you more working time. But if you're using normal PVA, just do it in a shorter, smaller area. And then you also need um, a brush to apply it. Gosh, I really picked this one up. A spray bottle if you want to apply top layers of glue to put second layers of grass on. And I always recommend doing two or three layers of grass. I use my dilute matte mod podge mix for that quite often or you can buy a layering spray you can see it there in the background and layering spray is a acrylic spray it's if you use the pump spray i don't find it as good as this aerosol but the aerosol is only available in the uk or was only available in the uk because of shipping to the us and then the last thing you need is obviously static grass got to be honest knock is very bright and european Woodland Scenics is very sludgy and looks like it's already got a hefty coat of dust on. You can mix them up to get what you want. I use a lot of WWS grass, which is UK based. It has a lot of browns, really good colours. I tend to use Knock Spring or Summer Grass um, or WWS Spring or Summer Grass for most of my grass. But Knock has odd bits of yellow and red thrown in there just to give it variety. So there we go. It can be just a little bit, you know, hmm. But I've done whole videos on grass, so I'm not going to major on the tools and materials. If you want to get into grass, just be aware there are tools and materials that you need to buy. Um, Timbersurf, you can make your own mock moulds, paint a rock a lump of coal with many layers of latex or add thicks of tropic additive to silicon to brush on and cast plaster of Paris. I've done that, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've done that a lot. It's... Um, long-winded if you're using the drying latex and I put talc into mine to bulk out some of the later layers. Um, has Kathy covered plaster weld yet? No. What What would you want me to cover on it? Just let me know because it's, it's not on my list to cover. So just briefly, trees, um, natural um, twigs, I think this was a rosemary bush that popped its clogs, <coughs> or got pruned um, you can have natural you can buy plastic armatures you can buy all sorts of things and these are really in the materials end you won't need to get these unless you can buy perfectly good commercial trees if you want to make your own sea moss can be a really good way of adding branches on you know getting that extra um, density it can look just like sea moss if you're not careful um, you can also buy plastic armatures. These were dirt cheap little things and I've rarely used them, but I have used them up. I used them as dead trees on a diorama. Um, or you can make your own from wire and this is fine florist wire. I think 28 or SWG or something like that. So trees again, there's whole videos I've done on trees and then the brushing latex you can use on the rock moulds. This is what you would use to make those rock moulds, but you have to let each layer dry and do them quite thinly because it won't dry once the outer bit's set. Or you can use it to build up layers around your wire 
trees to just get rid of the twist that's in the wire. Um, so that's a really useful product for either of those. And I have actually made trees from art mache, bigger scale ones, round wire to add the bark texture on. I've even 3D printed trunks and added wire branches on on top. And then you can just buy trees. There we are, just buy your trees instead. So that's trees. Once you've got your trees, your base, I add ground foam to bolt them out a bit. And then I, these are the leaves I showed earlier, but you add leaves on to get it to look better. So there we go. Um, right, here have we got. Norm, another great, another tip. Um, landscape bark from nurseries makes great wet walls. They are light and take paint well. As I said, Norm, I've never got them to look good. So I'm just gonna let other people explain that one. Um, I can never get them to look good. Um, fox leaf litter. For leaf litter under trees, real leaves harvested in autumn, dried in a warm oven and run through a cheap coffee grinder or a blender such as we have here. I've got a kitchen blender. I've also got a coffee grinder. They do different layers of thinness and thickness. I use that for ground foam, that's why it's green. And Tamsin says another material to use for rock is bark, best for sedimentary rock formations. Yeah, um, people get some great looking bark, but I've never really, yeah, I need to work on it. Timber Surf says, why are armatures on my nemesis? The trick is not to try and put everything into one go, but to make branches and then put the branches together. So if you are making bushes or trees, I've done a five minute video on bushes and I recommend that you check that out. But the base of them is just something like polyfiber. I also put this over trees to add the branch structure in. You can get it, I dyed the brown from normal quilt material, I think. The green came as a base under some Gage Master grass mats. And then you can buy green polyfiber from Woodland Scenics. It's, it's, which is the right sort of colour already. Um, and then I'm just gonna whiz quickly. It's only got eight minutes left. Um, oops. Right, um, you can buy lichen or lichen or um, moss, that's sort of Spanish moss. You can buy horsehair, rubberized horsehair which is great for brambles, anything with long arching branches. It's in loops, so just remember to clip the loops a bit, but I love it for that. And then you can use your sea moss. Again, nature, tr forest in a box, some people call it. You know, sea moss armatures, natural trees, loads of different names for it. And it comes like that. You can try straightening it and hanging it to get it to straighten, or you can just accept that it's bent and put it onto I, I like to make my actual trunks from something else and use that for branches. And then, uh, or you can just make small um, bushes from, this is plumber's hemp and, uh, my name escaped me, um, the stuff they use to make, the, the brown stuff is the stuff they use to make beards when you were at a theatre or something. And you can make little tufts of those, or you could use static grass. And actually, I use static grass to add branches onto all of my bushes and trees so I go over them that sort of thing with static grass and 10 to 12 mil and it sticks out and just puffs it out a bit if you're doing conifers you can blow them down with a hairdryer and get a sort of vertical hanging static grass branches so static grass over an armature adds so much bulk and interest to it it's really good and then once you've got your base, you've got your base tree from the previous set, you've got your base bushes from this set, it's time to get on to leaves. Now, um, I would always put ground foam down first because it's cheaper. I would fill up my trees with a bit of ground foam, Woodland Scenics, and then over the top I'd put knock leaves or hecky leaves because they're my two favourite brands of leaves. Other brands out there. One's made from paper I'm less keen on. The knock ones are punched, so they are sort of rounded towards the edges. And it's a punch machine, they're really useful. Um, laser cut ones tend to be better in bigger scales. And then, bear in mind, you can just put entire clumps of ground foam on from Wooden Scenics to create trees that way. You know, there's, there's many different ways. But the trick is to layer. I start with a base. I add on um, polyfiber 
I add on static grass perhaps, I add on ground foam and then I put on a sprinkling of leaves which are more expensive but you only need to see a few with your eye to get the feeling the whole thing's covered with leaves. There we go. Trees in like two minutes. We're going to go five minutes over folks but we'll be done. Um, and then water I'm just gonna do as well. Um, so Ravidson Express, there's always an expensive repair for my car when I went to buy the book. That takes all my money. It's okay. I'll let you off. Um, King Bronzel. Oh, I was just asking because I build Gumpler, but all the stuff I use don't seem to melt the plastic enough for seam line removal. Uh, Tamiya Extra Thin. Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. It's the only thing I use on plastic kits. Absolutely brilliant. Um... Doc Roberts, I find some real trees if I can, then soak them in water down PVA to let it soak in to make them a bit stronger. That's a really great idea. Um, that's a really great idea. Right, just pause that. Um, free is better. Dead leaves are free in my garden blasted every year. That's very true. Um, the only thing with dead leaves is you have to dye them if you want green leaves. Um, Timber says, no, rubberized horsehair is no longer made from horsehair for the animal protesters. It's actually made from coir. We had this debate on a previous one, didn't we? Stephen's just turned up. Yep, we're all fine. You're almost at the end. Um, but don't worry. Um, job got cancelled. That's a shame. And then Timber Surf, you can still get the real stuff for restoring seat cushions, but it's much more expensive. And actually, one of my friends is allergic to it, so not that great. My favourite gloss varnish for doing water effects is Tamiya because it's easy to get hold of and it dries with a beautiful gloss that most gloss acrylic varnishes don't, but it is still acrylic based-ish. It cleans up with water anyway, let's put it that way. Um, so I would always use small drops of Tamiya for anything, the clear, for anything that's a small amount of water. Um, so that's a great material to have for glossing anything, whether it's glossy mud or glossy... Um, well, yeah, just anything. After that, I would use UV resin. UV resin is good, but I find if you put paint or pigments in it, it sometimes seems to boil them when it gets hot, when it dries, sets with UV light, and you can get little bubbles in them, and it can it just make the surface a little bit kind of not quite right. So you, I always do a clear top layer if I'm colouring the base, because like puddles dark at the bottom. So that is a great one, UV resin. It's for jewellery, just off Amazon. Um, you can use water pastes to create water. So that's a great one in your modelling arsenal. You can need brushes and palette knives to manipulate them. I've done a, quite a few videos with Clearfix, which is a hybrid polymer. Check out my um, Treadwell ones and my Speedboat one for that. And... Woodland Scenic Snow is my secret ingredient for foam. I got that from Real Train Hobbies. He's had a six month break and just come back. So he's 3D printing water and then going to cast it. I have no idea how that's going to work. So I'm waiting for that next video. I just, I can't get my head around it at all. Um, the 3D print bit I got, but I couldn't get my head around the casting, how that's going to work. So that's going to be really interesting to see. Um, but Woodland Scenic Snow, I never use it as snow. It's not at all my favorite snow, but it's great for adding foam into water. Um, and then scales for doing epoxy and then acrylic. Oh, the acrylic's just um, sheet acrylic for putting down under waterfalls. This is tools and materials, remember, not how-tos. And then Mod Podge, Gloss Mod Podge is really useful for um, gloss, but I find it a bit thin if you want steep, oops, steep. Mm, where am I? Oh, you went back to the beginning. That's why you're not there. Um, right, here we go, right back to the end again. Um, if you want steep um, stuff, um, it just, I find it's, it's a bit too thin. And then we've got deep pour epoxy. That's the epoxy that I now use for all my deep pour because I found the um, other stuff just didn't cut it. It's a German brand, so I don't know if you can get it in the US. It's deep pour. You need deep pour resin to do proper resin on rivers of various levels. The wooden scenic ones are fine, but they're just a lot more expensive over here. And I colour it, and I bought some proper resin colouring colours over the time and I've got silicon ones and I've got silicon water and I've tried all sorts of stuff for water I've done almost every technique there is but I still mostly come back down to using gloss mod podge 
um, splash gel by Green Stuff World. Don't like to recommend Green Stuff World because they do like to nick other people's ideas and get a lot of slate for it. Um, and, you know, just, yeah. Um, anyway, but, you know, those sorts of gels that are more or less clear to start with are really useful. Um, so that's my water tools and materials. So there we go. We're at two minutes past ten. I whizzed through the end, but we're there. Um, so I, as you can see, when I say I'm demoralised because my house is full of stuff, look how much stuff there is just here. What you're not seeing is the cupboards full of foam, the cupboards full of different types of foam, the cupboards full of, you know, more foam and more foam, the cupboards full of warbler. Did I just pronounce that right? Yeah, warbler. And, um, you know, bendy foam for doing cosplay, the cupboards full of glues, the cupboards full of paint. I've got three wall cupboards just full of paints of various different sorts, from artist to hobby to different types of hobby. And I've got, actually, I've probably actually got five cupboards. So I've got a cupboard downstairs and then four cupboards upstairs, which are mostly paint and inks, I didn't mention inks at all, pigments, just so many materials you can end up. So I think my final thing to say on tools and materials is you don't need all of this. I do this for a living and I've done almost everything for a book. So I bought some of this stuff just for a book or just for one diorama um, or just for one thing. So what you need to do is just buy it when you need it, not because it's a cool product and you want it. And you know, see if there's an art store variety that is cheaper than the small bottled um, modeling branded stuff. Never buy anything from a big name if it's just a rebrand of a generic product. So if um, Games Workshop started selling tile grout to do your scenery with, I would be telling you all day to go to the DIY shop and buy tile grout instead of using the Games Workshop product. They don't but they do repackage art, gloss gels and stuff like that. Um, and UV resin you can get from Amazon for people doing nails and things like that much cheaper than you can get it from a model shop. So it's, it's worth having a look around. Everybody here has given loads of ideas on the chat, so scroll back through it for free stuff you can get, whether it's going to, someone suggested, going to your local DIY shop and seeing if um, they've got any split bags of grout you can get, because they can't sell them, they might give them you for free. That was somewhere else that I saw. So there's loads of great tips out there for keeping the price down. Um, and one of them is an awful, you know, use white packing, you know, use the white packing foam that you get. It may not be the best foam, but it works as a foam. Use the card you get in your cardboard boxes. Use the stuff Amazon wraps that paper in and perhaps put plaster over it or something. Always look for a great, cheap alternative before you go out and spend money. Because I have a fortune of stuff here, and after a while it starts going off. Your resins go off, your paints dry up. So if you're not going to use it all, it can actually be wasted money. I've got AK Interactive um, sludge green kind of colours, and I must have bought it twice because it keeps setting in the bottle. I've stopped buying it. You know, you just need to find what works for you and try not to spend too much money. But there's so much you can buy. Just think what space it will also take in your house before you buy it all. So anyway, that's where I am. Thank you for watching. Um, Norm says a great jam-packed two hours. Kathy, well done. Thank you. See you next month. Bye. Thanks, Norm, Digger and Timber for keeping you all in order. Not that you needed it. Um, Dot Roberts says, lol, sounds my, my face. Everybody else is going, so I'm saying good night. Thank you for coming. If you want any questions, then, you know, just drop me a line, comment under the video or something, and I'll answer them for you. And next time, we're talking workshops and studios. So my new studio will get a reveal. Hopefully, it will be tidy by then. Can't promise. And, um, yeah, it's going to be fun to look at... Um, <laughs> That's next time Tamsin. Tamsin said there's one tool you haven't mentioned, 3D printers. Perhaps we'll do a whole one on 3D printers if people are interested. Let me know in the comments if you are, because the chat's about to end. And thanks again, guys. See you next time.